People are generally driven to achieve a certain status level or standard of living that they, in essence, believe will bring them respect and the life they dream of having. For some people, it's power. For others, it's the need for validation and respect. Still, others are driven by freedom or survival. Proposition Joe, however, is a rare example of a person whose ambitions aren't really clear. We know it's not to become king of the game because he stays in the background and seems to prefer keeping a lower profile, and he doesn't seem to want to go legit either. So, what is Prop Joe's endgame? Prop Joe uses his wit and intellect to make deals with his rivals and allies to keep his position secure and his supply protected, but beyond that, he doesn't seem to really make a play in one particular direction. Joe also seems to find some sort of pleasure in playing the middle against both ends. There are several times when he manipulates situations when he doesn't really need to, or when a more straightforward approach would be better or simpler. But to really look at Prop Joe, we need to start at the beginning. In a flashback scene from Joe's days as a school kid, he is seen attempting to sell another kid the results to a test. The other kid threatens to beat Joe and take the results without paying. Without blinking an eye, Joe nonchalantly rebuffs his threats and tells him he should reconsider as he'll need Joe for future tests in the near future. When the kid pays less than what he owes, Joe then goes to his teacher and actually gets her to pay for information on who will be cheating on the test, thus getting back at the other kid and making up the money he lost. This is an important scene because Joe is shown throughout the show as a man who sort of has all the answers. People seem to believe whatever he says without question and he always seems to find a way to come out on top. What makes that so interesting is Joe isn't the kind of person that really commands respect just on his personality. He's soft-spoken, he isn't a violent or intimidating person, and he comes off as sort of a big brother figure. People like Joe because he's a likable guy. But the truth is, Joe was never the person who he portrayed himself to be. The kid who threatened to beat up Joe tells him, you're a snake, Joe. But Joe responds, I don't have a reputation for doing business that way. However, the kid immediately questions the validity of the test and almost immediately calls Joe a snake, meaning that Joe in fact does have a reputation for being devious. Shortly after, when Joe pulls his teacher to the side to tell her about the cheating kid, before he even says anything, she rolls her eyes and says, what is it this time? So again, he has a reputation of being a hustler who always finds himself in the middle of things. Fast forward to the events of the show and Joe is the same person he was in 1962. He's always in the middle of everything and he's always trying to manipulate the scenario toward his favor. Up until the show starts, it seems like he's done a pretty good job of it too. As the show continues, Joe's schemes get bigger and have more consequences. Joe is able to manipulate others into doing things for him as well, such as when he was able to work with Stringer to pit Brother Muzon against Omar in Season 2, and in Season 4 he gets Omar to stick up a card game that Marlo is playing in, hoping this will get Marlo to finally join the co-op. Though the plan is a success, it also has consequences as it gives Marlo an inroad to the Greeks which he eventually uses in order to thwart the co-op. This causes Joe to finally meet his demise after realizing he dug himself too deep of a hole by getting in the middle of things with Marlo. I found Prop Joe interesting because he's a character that has a lot of influence, but due to his inability to stay in his own lane, he's unable to really gain anything. He's the kind of person that just can't leave well enough alone. When the co-op faced a problem with Marlo taking up too much territory and the New York dealers also infringing on their territory, instead of actually devising a plan to deal with the problems in a way that would minimize risk, Joe invites the one person that everyone knows is ruthless with open arms. During the co-op meeting when one dealer says he'd like to see Marlo in the co-op, Joe stays silent. He neither questions or even brings up any reservations despite the fact everyone else just got done talking about how dangerous Marlo is. Later on, Slim accurately predicts that Marlo was going to betray him, but Joe dismisses it, which actually tells us a lot about him. So let's look at Joe's strengths. Joe was good not only at reading people, but knowing what they wanted, which he always used to his advantage. It was how he was able to talk himself out of so many situations and turn a negative situation into a positive one nearly every time it happened. Joe understood what was valuable to people, and he always had something they wanted or access to. When I got my first job in high school, my mom told me to make myself indispensable to my boss, so no matter what happened, they couldn't get rid of me. Joe did the same thing. People thought they needed him even if they really didn't. Not only did Joe sell people access to things they wanted, but he did it in such a way that they thought they could only get it from him. Joe knew that most of the people he dealt with weren't going to investigate what he told them or see if they could get what they wanted elsewhere, which is another advantage that he had. Joe also had a way with people. He's well liked. You can tell by the way others spoke about him that he was well respected. He may not always have been the most ethical, but it seems that most people just chalked that up as the price of doing business with him, and since they were getting what they wanted too, there was really no reason to make a big deal out of it. But now, when we look at Joe's flaws, we begin to understand why things fell apart for him. His biggest flaw was his complacency. 
While Joe was smart and good at reading people, he thought he was smarter than everyone else. He's been playing the same game since at least 1962, and he got really good at playing it too. His strategy of being able to assist people in getting what they wanted at a price he wanted had worked for four decades, so Joe had no reason to believe he couldn't continue to use the same strategy. He never even considered Omar and Marla were exceptions to the rule, but they were just two people that he could manipulate just like everyone else. A man with Joe's tenure in the game should have at least been highly skeptical of Marlo, but instead, Joe just tries to recruit him thinking he's going to be easy to control despite warnings from others and evidence to the contrary. Marlo knew how to take advantage of Joe always having his guard down around him. Joe introduces Marlo to his lawyer, shows him how to run a scam, and feeds him with information that an internet search could have found, but in some ways, he was handing the keys right over to Marlo while expecting him not to take them. When Marlo finally corners Joe before he can leave town, Joe begs for his life, saying he'll go away and live quietly and not come back. Marlo calls his bluff because he knew that Joe is the type of person that can't leave things well enough alone and needs to have his hands on everything. Marlo beat Joe at his own game and Joe paid the price. On the other hand, Omar also knew how to smell through all of Joe's BS. Joe tells Omar if he ever steals from him, he'll kill his whole family. It's clear that Omar doesn't believe it as he doesn't even react when he's told that, and later not only does he steal from Joe, but he sells a stolen product back to him. Also, when Omar tells Joe his time ran out, not only was he referring to Joe's little scheme he was currently up to, but in a sense he was telling Joe, your time's up, I figured you out, and your streak is over. He also warns Joe to avoid doing anything devious as he knew what Joe was going to try to do before he did it. Based on Joe's reaction, we can see that he's never been challenged like this before. Another flaw is Joe never really asserts himself as a dominant person or a leader that commands respect. Despite owning the drug connect, he still acts like a participant in the New Day co-op rather than the man in charge who calls all the shots. Stringer acts as a chair and Joe is more of a moderator than anything. This makes him come from a position of weakness, which may have been a sign to Marlo that Joe wasn't capable of holding on to it. As someone who is always looking to take advantage of every opportunity, it's interesting that Joe doesn't use the drug connect more to his own advantage considering how valuable it is. He doesn't really protect it, and he doesn't really seem to be concerned about what could happen if he loses it. In fact, he basically tells Slim Charles that the Greek will trust him over Marlo just because he's been working with him longer. Again, this is a passive role rather than an active dominant role, and it caused him to miscalculate Marlo's actions. In the end, Joe was his own worst enemy. He's a guy at the blackjack table that hits a winning streak, but can't walk away once he's made enough. He just has to stay in the game, and not only does he stay in the game, but he tries to get others to play their cards the way he wants them to. I worked with a Prop Joe type person once, and I was one of the people that fell for the con. I didn't realize until much later what actually happened. See, people like Prop Joe are great at making themselves seem useful. They come off as reliable and helpful. They're personable. Remember, Joe was a likable guy, and his cons weren't a big show. They were small and subtle. A little truth here, a little truth there, a small manipulation of the facts, followed by some more truth, and he used that formula with multiple people, and all of a sudden no one knows what really happened, but the person gets whatever they wanted and no one knows any better. Unfortunately, you may also run into people like this at work or in your personal life. The important thing to remember is always watch for patterns. Past behavior is the best predictor for future behavior. Pay close attention to things that sort of make your head tilt. If your intuition says something seems wrong, it probably is. Listen for subtle changes in a story or things that get added into a story. If you do find yourself in a situation like that, ask clarifying questions. Never be afraid to ask people to clarify. Don't ever assume you heard wrong. The people around Joe just assumed he was right and had good intentions. Trust your instincts. As a leader, it's your job to sift through the garbage people try to push on you. Ask yourself, what is this person really saying and what are they really asking me for? Ask yourself, what do I want out of this and what do they want out of this? Practice going through this level of questioning and it will eventually become a habit that will help you quickly decipher whether the person is legitimate or a con artist. Great leaders ask great questions both of the people around them and of themselves. In any sort of negotiation in business, it's important to know exactly what you want and what you're willing to compromise on. It's also important to understand the person you're bargaining with, just like Marlo and Omar knew who Joe really was. When I was still in my early career, I can remember getting really excited when someone would make an offer for a partnership that I thought would be great, but when I'd go to my boss about the details, she'd have to rein me in and basically tell me to read the fine print. I learned really quick that while I might be getting something I really wanted, I learned I was actually giving up some of my own control and would be responsible for doing most of the work. 
In other words, it was a one-sided partnership, and that's what people like Joe count on. In conclusion, always read the fine print. Never be afraid to walk away even if the offer sounds amazing, and never be afraid to call someone on their bluff. This is where your skill in asking clarifying questions can help you sort out the full details. Eventually, when you're dealing with a gamble in your professional life, play the long game. Watch for patterns, ask the questions no one else will, and never compromise on what you know you need. Eventually, you'll end up the winner because eventually their time will run out.